We were just saying a moment ago before we began that uh, my daughter had her first baby in March. And so in four months, uh, we see a beautiful transition into her divine feminine uh, from the moment the baby arrived. I mean, she was, of course, in pregnancy. It's growing, it's growing. She's growing softer. And in the softness is a strength. It's not a, a weak softness. Mm -hmm. It's a strong softness. It's a, a protective, mothering softness. But then when she had her baby, uh, we are, like, amazed. Because we've known her all her life. Mm -hmm. And we can see that... Uh, it's like the Divine Mother is living in her body. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, this is the ultimate. Uh, whenever I talk to mothers and they say, oh, how can I do this? How can I do that? How can I uh, be successful in my life? I say the only answer is baby and family first. If you give your entire heart and soul to baby and family, then I believe uh, all the spirits of nature come and Ganesha comes and protects you and takes care of you and will give you everything you need. And your success will be deeper, mm -hmm. wider, stronger success. It's not the same as uh, success of a businessman. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's our feminine strength. And um, people always say to me, oh, you have so many children. Now you have so many grandchildren. Uh, how can you do your work? It's because I have those children. It's because of my grandchildren that I have this divine work. Otherwise, I'm not a midwife. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I see it with every profession. The mothers become more successful, more stronger, more happy mm -hmm. if they give their heart and soul to the baby. Well, my first book, birth, book, my first book is After the Baby's yeah. Birth, A Woman's Way to Wellness. Maybe someday we'll bring this out in Russian language. Uh, so what happens at the time that you're pregnant and then you prepare for the birth and then you actually give birth, no matter how the birth goes, even if the birth isn't what you dream, but your baby comes out, even if they make a cesarean on you, you had a birth, your baby's been born, you lived in the miracle. So for the mother, she's reborn. And the rebirth of the mother is uh, incredible. And as long as she feels that she's supported and loved, mm -hmm. because she needs to be able to love mm -hmm. and, and support, give and take like mm -hmm. this, if she's supported and loved, then her happiness is going to grow, her effectiveness. Um, you know, there, there are those discomforts in pregnancy and then a postpartum, of course, like uh, my daughter, she had a few stitches because she had a tear. Um, even she had a very gentle birth. And then she had this discomfort. And then the breasts become big, and then yeah. her milk was, I, you know, she didn't know for sure it's okay. And, you know, we just reassure her. We make the hot ginger compresses. If we can give a woman that 42 days of sacred space, and this is what Ayurveda says, and every ancient culture says the mother must have 42 days of rest and completely the family serving her, cook for her take care of her so that the only job the mother should do is stay in a bubble with baby the spiritual bubble mm -hmm. you know and this is how hopefully in the divine marriage the partner of the mother the husband or some mo mothers have partners not mm -hmm. man but the partner of the mother will really see her divine nature and will protect her and really learn to respect her the hardest thing for mothers today is to get respectful care in pregnancy. They don't get respectful care. They have prenatal scare. Yeah. They get frightened in prenatal care. And the, the doctor makes them afraid. You have too much water, not enough water, baby's too big, baby's too small, baby's in the wrong position. So many things to make yeah. you afraid. And, and then when you have your baby, then they say in the hospital, oh, your breast is too big, your breast is too small, your milk is too much, your milk is too little, your milk is too thin, your milk is too thick. Better you just listen to your grandmother. What do the grandmothers say? If your grandmother is not alive, you have to ask in your heart for the grandmother inside. Mm -hmm. And the earth mother is your grandmother. You know, we have, we have our Ibu Prati, we, and she cares for us. 
And when you go through the experience of childbirth, I remember the first time I was a teenager, and I, I don't know why I felt like Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus. I'm not religious, but she came to me and she stayed with me until now. She never left me. She came to me in labor, and I feel her presence. And if I don't know what to do, I just have to look inside and ask her, okay, I know you're inside. You planted a seed in me. You can teach me how to be a mother. So I think 42 days is essential of really eating gentle foods like dal, berry, soupy dal, and, and uh, just resting, you know, staying in the quiet space and staying in the home if possible. And not every mother can have this, but we can try for that. I think all governments should give mothers a special 42 days of care, someone coming to the home to massage them. Uh, I like to call it baby moon, like a honeymoon, baby mm -hmm. moon. So there are physical challenges for pregnancy, for the birth itself, and for uh, the postpartum. But really, they can all be cared for in the most traditional ways. You know, mm -hmm. with very few exceptions. You know, if a mother is really sick, of course, then she needs special help. We have a mom now with very, very, very high blood pressure after the birth. Mm -hmm. Before is fine, but after the birth. And now she, she is taking medicine from the doctor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we're also bringing her special food. We are taking care of her. Her husband's keeping her in the home, quiet mm -hmm. space. He plays soft music for her, and she's getting massage. And her only job is breastfeeding. Even her husband is so worried for her, he's changing the diaper. Because he said, OK, you do the input, I do the output. <laughs> because she's not well, you yeah. know? She needs a special care. So if we can give each mother this special bubble of peace and love for a minimum 42 days, I think mm -hmm. we'll have a different kind of world. Yeah. I want for all mothers to know that, uh, especially if they have a cesarean, they didn't fail their baby, you know? There are very many things that we don't know. Uh, there, are, there are heavenly plans and divine plans, and there's as if a, a spiritual war being fought against women now in our planet. And I know it sounds... Uh, Maybe it sounds too strange, mm -hmm. but I'm brave enough to say that there's a war being fought and it's our bodies are the battleground. I mean, look at the way women are forced to give birth in hospital with their feet in the stirrups. It's a torture table. It's just like a medieval torture yeah. table. And then, then, of course, the mother will go through trauma. But I want every mother to know that she's a hero because she did whatever was needed. Even if she went through the war, she brought her baby to earth. And this is a spiritual, like a, a fulcrum. And so we don't know what it takes to bring. Sometimes the soul of the baby needs to go through some hell with the mother mm -hmm. so that the soul of the baby can come here in the body and do some good work on our planet. So for all those mothers, I just want to hug them and say, it's, you did well. You did everything you can do. You did it. And now, after the baby's born, there are some traumas. And no one should say to you, it's OK, at least your baby's alive. No. Someone should just hug the mother and let her cry. Just let her cry. And then help her to breastfeed. Because the oxytocin and the hormones of breastfeeding and the eye-to-eye -eye contact with your baby and, and keeping this bubble, this sacred bubble, this is what will heal your trauma and your baby's trauma. Uh, it's uh, breastfeeding is like the medicine of all medicines. It's mm -hmm. the crest jewel of medicines. I, I love breastfeeding for that reason. <laughs> yeah, I, I know a man who has a terrible pain in his body. He's very very sick, and when his wife had a baby, he starts to drink a small bit of her breast milk every day, and his pain is gone. After a few days. Until now, his pain is gone. Mm -hmm. no, no medicine from science could help him. You know? So we know that 
it's not just food. It's spiritual food, mm. it's physical food, and it's medicine. And so breastfeeding is the next focus. And those mothers who cannot breastfeed or something happens and they're not able to breastfeed, it's not because they do not love their baby. It's because they don't have the right support. They don't have the right information. Even they, so many mothers want to breastfeed and nobody helps them. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's why Bumi Sehat, all of our midwives, if we call the mothers after they go home, they stay until it's easy to breastfeed. After they go home, we call them every day, many times a day, how is breastfeeding? If the mother is crying or worried or sad or we hear the baby crying, we go on a motorcycle. Two midwives immediately go. Even if it's in other side of the island, even if it's three, four hours, we go because baby cannot wait, mother cannot wait. Mm -hmm. and, and because breastfeeding is so important. You cannot have peace on earth if you stop feeding the baby breast milk. If you feed the baby from this uh, artificial formula, mm -hmm. I, I believe you cannot make a peace on earth. Again, if you're a mother and you uh, did not have the opportunity to breastfeed, something happened, nobody supported you, you're not a bad mother. But next time, let's find the support for you so that you can breastfeed mm -hmm. and care for your baby as you wish in the most natural, loving way. So many mothers are the victims of big business, yeah. the big business of infant formula. When I read about it and I imagine how it can be such a, a plan against humanity, against our, our souls, against the divine creation, to make a business to stop mothers from breastfeeding. And this is terrible. And the hospitals, they endorse feeding with bottle. And the, so many, unfortunately, so many doctors, even midwives do, endorse it, the mm. bottle milk. And the bottle milk is so bad for our environment because every day thousands of hectares of rainforest are being cleared, just cut, to make space for more cows, more cows. Not for the milk in your, in your chai or your latte, but for the milk in the baby bottle. Mm. This is uh, destroying our planet. Then they package it with paper, tin, and they put it in truck and airplane and boat. And then it, it makes so much pollution, so much waste, so many trees die. If you want to do something for the Mother Earth, for our environment, breastfeed your baby. It's so profound. The effect is amazing. All of those things can make labor more difficult for some women. Uh, because remember, oxytocin is a hormone of love. And the oxytocin has to flow for labor to go ahead. So anything that blocks the flow of love, um, if you have a difficult relationship with your mother, your husband, your father, yourself, um, the flow of love within your heart can be disrupted. And that's why childbirth is such a cleansing process yeah because you have to open mm -hmm. in one way or another even if they make a cesarean and open you with an with a surgery one way or another you will open and you will have your baby so one way or another the psychology opens and is clean mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's why labor can be so challenging because it's the journey of the heroine the heroic woman going in the Native American tradition, we say that the mother goes to the land of the dead and she brings the soul back from the ancestors to her baby. And the baby's been coming and visiting, staying in the body, flying back. But in order to come and incarnate in the body, the mother has to go there and take the hand of the baby's soul and bring the baby back. So we have to support the mother with love. We have to remember that oxytocin is very shy Mm -hmm. So if you make the mother feel shy, if you embarrass her, like I see in the hospitals here, they say, where is your checkup book? Where is your card? And they say, I forgot. I'm in pain. I forgot everything. You forgot? Where are your baby clothes? You don't need baby clothes to give birth, but they shame you. And then the mother cries, and then her labor stops. Yeah. You know? Anything can interrupt labor. You saw it with yourself. It's so delicate. Yeah. Everything has to be in perfect balance, the sun, the moon, the stars, the water in the ocean, everything.
and the water in the family, the emotions of the family. Mm -hmm. And not until the family's ready, and then the baby says, okay, yes. And the Divine Creator is just watching and saying, okay, when you're all ready, this baby's coming. You know, we have so many moms, they're late, so many days, 10 days, 12 days, like that. But I know their baby and the Divine Creator are just waiting for the right moment for there to be a, a clear space. And then as soon as there's that peace in the water, the baby will jump through. But there's so many ways to interfere with labor and disrupt labor. It's so delicate. And yet it's so strong. So once it gets going, as you noticed, <laughs> it just goes. Yeah. Uh-huh. So uh, oxytocin is also uh, does not like cold. So there are two kinds of cold. There's cold temperature where your body feels cold. But the other cold is cold-hearted. If you go to the hospital and the people there have a cold heart to you, it will be more difficult, more painful. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for the warm heart and the warm body. So sometimes the hospital is like air conditioning. This is hard for the mother because her oxytocin is trying to go, and yet the cold is fighting with the oxytocin. Mm. Yeah. Any way that we can allow the mother's natural hormones to flow, which is only the flow of love, then she's going to do better. Mm. You know, last li night, the first time mom, uh, she came in and everyone in her husband's family said, she can't do it, she can't do it, she can't do it. And all the midwives said, yes, she can do it. <laughs> and then we're smiling. And then the mother-in-law, the husband's mother, we would just keep hugging her and hugging her. And soon, they all believed she can do it, and she did it. She had a beautiful baby. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even here now, because here in Bali, we cannot have water birth. And we do have a lot of Russian moms who come here, and we support them as much as we can. But, for example, it's difficult. I cannot do water birth for them except at home. And there's uh, so many times when I cannot be at every home every day, every night. Yeah. Uh, but it's time now on our planet to have a, an evolution, you know, in childbirth. An evolution. A revolution can be violent, can be... Can be uh, I mean, I'm afraid of revolution. We had very violent revolutions all over the world at different times in history. But if we make the R in revolution small and the E very big, we have a evolution. Mm -hmm. And then we're all asking for the same thing. And we're all working. Uh, in February, I will be at the Human Rights in Childbirth Congress. I'll be speaking there uh, in India and in Mumbai. Uh, everywhere you look on the earth, women are saying the same thing. We need to have our safe space for my birth, my body, my baby, my way. Mm -hmm. That's our song. No more, yes, doctor, yes, hospital, yes, yes. You know, who pays the hospital? Who pays the doctor? You know, don't go there and pay them if they don't give the service you want. You know, if you want to eat a beautiful vegetarian meal, you don't go to the place where they make a hamburger. Yeah. Right? Right. Because if you go to the place where you make a hamburger, they will give you a hamburger. Even you say, no, I don't eat this. So if you want gentle birth, we have to create a new restaurant. <laughs> you know? We have to change the hospitals. Even the furniture, making the woman... We are mammals. We should be near the Earth Mother. If you make her go up here on the table, how can her oxytocin flow? And we put her on the torture table. We have to change the furniture in hospitals. In Canada... You know that the midwives who work in hospital, they cannot keep their license unless they do some home births every year. Yeah. Yeah? It's not allowed to lose your home birth heart. So even the midwife in the hospital is very, very, very busy. Every year, if she can only do one home birth, it's okay. But she cannot go no home birth all year. Because home is where birth belongs. It's where it begins. So it's very difficult when the governments make it illegal, you know. Women before didn't vote, you know. Not so many years ago in the U.S., women didn't vote. Uh, I don't know what's happening in Russia, but uh, we've been fighting since I was a teenager becoming a mother for this, for this right to have our birth 
in a safe way, but in a sacred way, not in a medical way, because we're not sick. Mm -hmm. And if we have a real problem, there's a real complication, then we need help from the OBGYN, and we work together in harmony. But the thing is, is we cannot fight like a, a normal war, because yeah. this is childbirth. This is mothering, so our only weapon should be love. You know, if we're going to shoot them, we shoot them with flowers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And no matter how much love you fight the war with, if you're fighting, you have to just somehow find a clear, calm space. And for me, this is my challenge. You know, we've been putting the videos, Voice of the Mother, just from the mothers at Bumisehat, filming them for four or five minutes, speaking from their heart. What do you experience? And now the government is attacking me because these videos in Indonesia are going viral. And a mother says, I was forced to have a cesarean birth, not because I need it, but because the doctors need to practice on all the women in the hospital in Papua. So with my second baby, I came to Bumisehat. And my third baby, I came to Bumisehat. I had gentle birth. You know? And then the government says, you're not permitted at Bumisehat Midwives are not permitted to help a woman have a baby after she has cesarean. She has to have cesarean again. And they say to me, every doctor knows this. I said, but every midwife knows that it's not true. So why are we doing it? Every week we do one, two, three women who had cesarean first time, but now they have normal, mm -hmm. beautiful birth. You're not allowed anymore to help the breech baby. You're not supposed to help the twins. But those are all variations of normal. What's not normal is surgery birth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a miracle and saves lives, but it's not normal. So why are they not wishing for us to give the mothers a voice? You know, if you put this on the internet, the voice of the mother, the government gets mad. So I say, okay, if I'm doing something really wrong, I always answer them. If I'm doing something really wrong, then you must stop me. But if you look in your hearts and you see that Maybe I'm doing something with love. Then how can you stop me? And for 25 years, they've been threatening to deport me. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still here. But I always say to them, if I'm doing something wrong and bad, please deport me. Throw me away. Please. Because I'm not afraid. Because I know that the mother's way is the loving way, and the loving way is the divine way. But it's difficult, you know. Each of us has to give our heart and soul to this, to this war that has to be a gentle war, where the only weapon is love. And it's hard when people are, people are uh, abusing you, when people are threatening you and saying, "You cannot have your baby. You have to go to the hospital. You have to lay down. You have to have the the rules and the way the protocols of hospital." Then you feel threatened. So it's hard to keep you in your center. It's so difficult. It's really difficult. I understand. So, first of all, if the women could choose a midwife first. Mm -hmm. Because a midwife is... And choose a mother. A midwife is a mother. Even the midwife didn't have children. She has her potential to be a mother. Mm -hmm. You know? Midwife to mother care. If there's a complication, the midwife is going to hold your hand and say, now we go to the doctor together. Mm -hmm. Because now there's, no one wants to have a complication and ignore that and do something high risk, you know? Mm -hmm. That's why we have science, respect for nature, and adat, which is spirit. Mm -hmm. So spirit is the most important, you know? And you will stand on three legs, you never fall down. But you need spirit, and you need respect for nature, and sometimes, sometimes, rarely, you need science. So for now, I say try to choose a midwife. And if you have to go to a hospital, try to bring your doula. Mm -hmm. Bring a mother with you who can hold your hand, who can help protect you and hold a sacred space. And then I tell to the fathers or the partners of the mother, if the doctor is going to clamp and cut the baby's umbilical cord right away, just immediately put your hands on that cord and say, just a moment. So the, the mother's... Because normally now in the hospital, they will give the baby for one minute, two minutes to the mother to hold yeah. skin to skin. And then they say, enough. Because somehow they cannot bear to see love. They cannot bear to be in the room with love. So then 
the, the father or the mother's partner puts hands on the baby's belly right away like this, then they cannot cut the cord because it's now not sterile and they're so afraid. So then, then if the father says, just a minute, I'm praying, what can the doctor do? You know, yeah. this is a way that the doctor has to respect the prayer because it is a prayer. And then the, the doctor cannot cut the cord. Maybe you can keep your hand there for five minutes. That's amazing for the baby, mm -hmm. you know? But if you can keep praying and praying, finally the doctor will get tired. He'll go out of the room, smoke a cigarette. <laughs> Just keep praying. Yes, yes, doctor, I know. I move my hands, but I'm still praying with my baby. <laughs> and then the, then the baby will have a delayed cord clamping and cutting. Mm -hmm. So you have to find a way. Maybe it's a, a crooked road. Right now we're, it's in Kali Yuga, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so Kali Yuga is the most difficult time. Because even in Kali Yuga, you know that we mothers are bringing divine children. Um, I had my first baby when I was a teenager. So I was 18 years old and uh, I was pregnant, so I didn't know anything. I went to the doctor and the doctor, uh, he had a tool like this and he measured my bones, my butt, my everything. He says, you're so small, you cannot give birth even to a pencil. If the baby's skinny like a pencil, it still will not come out from your body. I said, but don't say that to me. I'm having a baby. I'm pregnant. I'm sure going to have a baby. Mm -hmm. So he, he said, no, it's not possible. You have to have a surgery. And I said, okay, I will never see you again because I'm not going to have a surgery. I'm going to have a baby and I will do it my way. And so after that, I never saw a doctor until now. I have doctors who are friends, doctors who work for Bumi Sehat, but me personally, I never went to the doctor again because that was so traumatic for me to go mm -hmm. to the doctor and he says to me, essentially, I don't believe in you. So I went and I found young midwives who never worked by themselves. They had a doctor, they did one birth with a doctor and they were brand new, just learning. And I said, okay, I don't want the doctor. I just want you to, young midwives, come on, please come to my house. And they said, well, we don't know what to do. You know, we're not experienced. We don't, we don't have any tools. We don't have the right knowledge. We didn't finish school. I said, it's OK. And they said, but we don't know how to do this, how to deliver the baby. I said, you don't deliver the baby. I deliver the baby. I know how, because I'm pregnant. So I know how to have a baby. And uh, they were so kind. And they came to my little house, like a small two and a half meters by six meter house. Yeah, maybe not six meters, so small, with wheels, but I had a nice garden. Mm -hmm. And in my garden, I grew my vegetables. And that was my medicine, my vegetables, and my, the love of my midwives. And they said, yes, we understand, you can do it, you can do it. And we didn't cut the cord right away because they didn't know how. <laughs> and then I still remember, uh, they said, the placenta should come already. It's been like a long time like an hour. So I said, okay, if you like to get the placenta, you get it. I don't want to get it. I have my baby. And they said, okay, we'll bring you the bowl and you get the placenta in the bowl. So I held the placenta here and I stood up and I squatted and <coughs> no bleeding, no tearing, nothing. All good. And my, uh, my baby was amazing. Breastfeeding was difficult the first week. Nobody could help me. And my mother uh, when she was coming straight from the Philippines to have her babies in the U.S., when she married my father, they told her, you're not permitted to breastfeed. So she didn't know how to breastfeed because they gave her injections so she didn't have milk, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't allow her to breastfeed in the American hospitals. So then when I was born, uh, I had no milk. So I didn't know how to breastfeed because I wasn't fed from the breast. But I learned. It was a, a difficult week, but I, I figured it out with my baby. Mm -hmm. I would say your baby is your first teacher. Some kind of fate. Uh, my, my father came to Indonesia. Uh, he was working for the government in America as a soldier. And uh, he came as a peacemaker in the 1960s, you know, the year of living dangerously. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of trouble in Indonesia and they needed to make peace so they they had some kind of a peace uh, collective. 
and my father was in that. And from here, he sent me in the mail a shadow puppet. Mm -hmm. And the shadow puppet, I really fell in love with the shadow puppet. And I love that when you have a shadow puppet, you can see what's in front mm -hmm. and what's behind the shadow. Yeah. And so uh, I promised myself as a little girl when I saw this shadow puppet that I will come to Indonesia. And then uh, the year that my husband and I came here, uh, my sister died from pregnancy because her doctor did not care for her correctly. She said, I'm not well. And he said, I don't have time. I'll see you in two weeks. She had hypertension and she had a stroke. So she died. Uh, if she had a midwife, I believe she was going to live. And I, I lost my sister. I lost my, the baby inside her, which I believe was a girl. A niece, mm. and I still always I feel her protecting my life. They're they're pushing me to do this work so that nobody's sister need to die. There's so many ways we can try to help. Sometimes you cannot help, but sometimes you can. And so my sister died, my midwife died, and then my best friend died, all in one year, less than one year, 11 months. And so I had to ask myself. Am I living every day, every night, every minute for love? And I was a mother. I was living in the country. I was milking goats, making cheese, giving my children goat milk. Mm -hmm. I was having a garden. All of our food I was growing. My children were schooling at home. They were not getting vaccine. They were living a pure, organic lifestyle. But my life was a compromise. I was not really living for love yet. Maybe 80%, but 80% wasn't enough for me. So somehow, my husband Will and I just got on an airplane with our children and we came here. We didn't know we would stay. We thought we would come here and just see a culture that worships children, that takes care of their old people. A culture that's Hindu like this. Not necessarily as a religion, but more as a, a purity of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will say the religion here is not perfect. It's very difficult for women. It has the special, wonderful things, and also a lot of hardship. You know, uh, it's a different kind of Hindu. I think we have lots of kinds of religion that we human beings try to make something so we can understand divinity. Mm -hmm. But we cannot understand divinity. We just have to find it inside. So. When I looked inside myself, I saw that we have a chance to stay in this village. We never left this village. I mean, there are beautiful places by the ocean, beautiful places in the mountain, but this became our village. So we love it. And it's not perfect, but we love it. It's now in this area of Ubud, it's crowded. Our village of New Kuning. New Kuning is the golden coconut. New coconut? Mm -hmm. Kuning is golden. And this is a kind of medicine golden mm. coconut, also represented by the mother's breast. So we, we love our village, but it's getting crowded, it's getting commercial, it's changing, but we still love her. Mm. So it was uh, by tragedy that I came to Indonesia. And then I didn't want to be a midwife because I didn't feel I was ready. But uh, my baby was born with just my husband. And they said, oh, maybe he's a dukun bayi, a catcher of babies, uh, a healer of babies. Or she is a, some kind of a midwife. Because the dukun bayi, the man who's catching midwives, because midwi catching babies, midwives here in Bali were sometimes men. Mm -hmm. In our village, we had a man. Ten days before I came to this village, he was dying. And on the day he died, he said, don't worry, in 10 days, I will send someone. And that person will be your new Dukan Bai, and then you will have someone to care for all the babies and the mothers. So we didn't know. We just came to the village 10 days later, just by accident. And then everybody looks at us and says, is it her or her husband? Who are or her or her husband coming to this village to be the new baby catcher? So uh, when the baby was 42 days old, we had his ceremony. So he has a name. 
And uh, after that, after the 42 sacred days, I can go out. Someone came in the night and woke me up in our house. Our house was so small then, just beginning this house. And they said, uh, somebody must come and help the, the mother and baby. The baby needs to be born now. And I said, who? And they said, you. <laughs> because you came here 10 days after he died. Who died? The healer, the Dukan Bai. I said, okay, I don't know what you're talking about, but I will go with you. So I went, my husband carrying the baby, and we went. There was no bridge here. There was only like iron this wide, like this wide. We have to walk maybe 80 meters across, across, across. And the river was really, and if you fall, you die. <laughs> and I was like, be careful, my baby. And I was so scared crossing. And then I got there, and there's a woman having a baby. And there's an old, old, old man. And he says, I cannot see anymore, but can you do this, help? I didn't do anything. I just helped her to take her baby to her breast. And then when the placenta was born, I had to hold her uterus so she doesn't bleed too much because she was bleeding a lot. And mm. then, uh, yeah, I don't know. She was fine. And then every night, one, two night, two night, three nights, they're coming to get me. On the full moon, sometimes three times in a night, I go to this village, I go to that village, I go to that village. I don't know these people. They just come and take me on a motorcycle or walking, sometimes really far in the rice fields, walking, walking, walking. So I made a birth kit and I start to study because I wasn't finished my midwifery school yet. Mm -hmm. But I finished. And then I, then I had the, uh, the blessing mm -hmm. of uh, an old woman came here. Her name was June Whitson. She was from England originally, but she married to the U.S. And she was really dying of cancer. And for her last job in her life, she feels she must come here and train me. So she came and she lived with me. And we went together to the villages. And she taught me how to be a midwife. And she told me, don't cut the cord. And she told me, if you are scared, you sing. So then we started the tradition of when the babies are crowning, so the midwives aren't doing something, talking or pushing the mother or making the mother nervous or interfering, we start singing. Om Bur Swaha. And then everything becomes peaceful. And like today, the baby was born and the grandmother was behind the mother and then the baby girl's being born, three generations. And she's singing Gayatri Mantra and crying. So beautiful. Because for me, that's medicine. We know that mantra is medicine, like mother's milk. Mm -hmm. So if we can give a song, instead of uh, shouting or do this, do that, you must do that, push, no, we just sing. Mm -hmm. yeah? And that's enough. If there's an emergency, we have medical skills, we can, we can deal with the emergency. And then we have respect for nature, but most important, we have spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, you came here with your husband? With four? With how many kids? Four children. Uh, we had together six children. Yeah. Uh, I had four, he had two. Uh, and two, my oldest children wanted to stay in America. They have a different father. They stayed there with him. Uh, and then they came later. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so we had the four. And then immediately we arrived here and we made Hanuman. I think the first night. <laughs> Pretty sure. <laughs> Because we can't sleep, we're so excited. It's Bali, it smells different, it sounds different. You know, you can hear the music of the bamboo over there, and the birds singing here, and the chicken, and the dog barking, and, and an incense burning. And so anyway, we made Hanuman, and then he was born here in the village. And when he was born, he had all the baby ceremonies. And how many years you are? Married with Will. Uh, Will and I came together and married one month before we made Hanuman. So about 25? 25, yeah. 25 years. Yeah. So and we came together and immediately just 
commitment. We didn't think yes, no, left, right, no. The children, he, his children needed a mother. My children need a father. They just, they just try. And uh, how, do you have a secret how to live together 25 years? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not always easy. Uh, yesterday, my uh, daughter-in-law, she came to me and she said, something's not right with your son. I need your help. So we came here quietly. The children we left with my husband, they, he made them some food. We came here quietly and I asked my son, I said, what's your energy is going out from the family? It's like your, like your uh, bag of water with many holes. You're leaking out all your energy cried. He said, I am leaking and something is not right and I don't know how to make it better. So I say, that's what our family can do for each other. You know? And I don't want to interfere with your marriage, but I'm your mother and your wife needs us to all work together as a family. And then, yeah, they just, I just said nothing and they really just, they just talk quietly. No fighting, no arguing, no disagreeing. Just talk about why my son became unhappy when normally he's happy in his marriage, why he's becoming unhappy, and what is happening in the energy of the world that's making him feel that way. And he doesn't want to uh, make a problem in his marriage or have a divorce, so he really wants to try. So in that time, they recommitted, and then they hug, and kiss, and then we have a meal together with the family, and also, many years ago, Will and I almost split. My son came to us and said, we feel something is really wrong. We feel that you are going to split. And we say no. We vote that you stay together. <laughs> and at that moment, it was more difficult to stay together than to go apart. But if we go apart, we tear the family apart. So we made a commitment to stay together. How? Oh. <laughs> I think uh, one you have to be you have to humble yourself because mm -hmm. the ego is easy to be hurt you know yeah. and once the ego is hurt oh my gosh the ego is jealous the ego is possessive the ego is negative um, and the ego can be very powerful too so yeah we had to humble ourselves it was difficult you know I think the secret for us is we made the children more important than ourselves. This is uh, the secret of Balinese culture. The youngest person in the village, the newest baby, is more important than all adults. So you cannot make a decision to, to break a family if it hurts the children. And it will always hurt the children. But again, it's not so easy, but you have to try so difficult. And I was already married twice before. Mm -hmm. And it was the most heartbreaking thing for my children and for me when the fathers left. I didn't want to lose the marriages, but uh, I had no control. And uh, you have uh, your own children born with you, yeah? yeah. You born and uh, children uh, which were born by another wo woman. Do you feel difference between them and between your love? Maybe in the first few weeks, mm -hmm. something different, but um, when the children were small, we all slept together in the same bed, you know? Mm -hmm. And we, our spirits, I think, were meant to be together. Like, uh, my children, they've spoken to me about remembering they were together in past life, all of them. Uh, they, they say that it was in a monastery somewhere in the mountains in India, mm -hmm. and they made a commitment to be together in this life in a family. Mm -hmm. From, and also, Will's first wife, Brenda, um, she was my friend really close friend and she died and so in a way I feel like the gift of her children 
is such a special blessing. And it wasn't always easy. I mean, Lakota, my daughter, is so close to me. But when she was 13, 14, 15, every day, you're not my mother. Don't talk to me. Okay. So if she comes close to me, I try to go away so she doesn't fight with me. And it was so difficult. It broke my heart every day. But I know that it has to be me who's strong. Uh, I even went to therapy because I said, I, I, I cannot always be the bad guy, the step monster. You know, the stepmother becomes step monster. And the therapist just said, just when you feel that, just tap your heart and say, I love myself. I just will center my mothering in my heart and it's going to be fine. And then one day, she said to me, Mom, how come you don't talk to me very much? I said, because you fired me. You said, I'm not your mom and don't talk to me. And she said, yeah, but I said, but you said it every day for two years. And she said, I did. I said, mm -hmm. And then she cried. She said, can I take it back? <laughs> so we just hugged. <laughs> And then yeah. when she had her baby, she made me her midwife. And I was so honored to catch her baby. Then she said to her father, you know, just because you're my dad, I'm going to be really shy. And when I give birth, I'm not having you near me, OK? You stay out. Yeah, of course, of course. But when she starts pushing, she looked at me. She said, where's my dad? <laughs> I need my dad. So he came and he held her hand. So, yeah. Also, when the children were little, we had a, a difficult time. So twice in our marriage, we almost split. And we had a difficult time, and I didn't know if we would stay together. I thought, I don't have more divorce inside of me. If I have to divorce, if he will leave, then maybe I die. I don't know, because I didn't have divorce inside me anymore. It's gone. I cannot find it inside me. And um, my daughter said to her, her father, even you're our real father, if you divorce from Robin, we go with her. All of us go with her because she's the mother. And it was shocking because he said, well, who, no one will go with me. And she said, no, no one will go with you. We love you, but if we all stay together with the mother, then you come back. So, of course, he cannot leave. So. It was a divine manipulation. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should be willing to fight for our, our families if we can. You know? It's very difficult Strong. because I tried three times, and the first two times I could not. Um, you know, even I love them, the fathers of my children, two children and two children. Uh, but I could not force them to stay with the family. I tried very hard to stay in my center and, and keep a sacred space for the family. But I wasn't doing such a good, t a good job then either. I mean, I was very emotional and uh, young, full of fire. I think it was really difficult to be married to me because I had so many dreams and I know that I have to do something for this world and I have to devote myself to that vision and the men didn't want that they want me to devote my vision to them you know but if you have a Dharma and you want to surrender to the divine Dharma you have to find a partner who will also share that Dharma like real like will. <laughs> yeah. You have to find a... My children love this story about a clown for God. You know? It's about a, a little boy who was so poor and he can only juggle. He learned to juggle so mm -hmm. he can get some coins. And then as he became older and older and older, he became the clown of God. He just juggles in the church. Uh, because secretly he knows that when he makes the children smile, God is smiling. Okay. So I feel like uh, Will is like the clown of God. He's playing music to make the children happy, because when the children are happy, then 
the divine creator is happy. Yeah. But uh, he never gets tired of me coming home and saying, oh, we have a baby girl. And uh, on his birthday every year, oh, yeah, we have a baby boy. And then the people will say, we heard it's your husband's birthday. So we have a lot of Wyan Will, Wyan Willie. <laughs> Even girls name Wyan Willie. I say, no, no, choose a different name. And they say, no, it's Will's birthday. We give him. And then if we go to market, the, the children will see two of us. Oh, Ibu Robin, and then they hug Will. <laughs> I say, excuse me, when I was with you and your mother was giving birth, I stayed with your mother all night, and Will is sleeping. <laughs> he didn't come. He was sleeping in bed. And then you hug him first. And they, I don't know why they love him. <laughs> he's, he's lovable. 